I will start now with uh, the part for silos and uh, pressure function of tanks. Um, so, and then we will continue with the other specific structures that I mentioned uh, before. So I will start with uh, silo constructions. Um, first of all, uh, which types of silos I'm, are covered by, the, uh, by part four? Um, so on one hand, we have uh, on-ground silo construction, but we have also elevated silos. Um, supported by um, probably supporting structures, but there's also, let's say, the possibility uh, that they have a skirt uh, extending to the ground. Uh, so this type is also uh, covered. And although it's not uh, explicitly, let's say, given with design rules, uh, it is also possible to transfer the, the principles of the seismic analysis procedure to other uh, materials, because uh, in practice, especially in industrial plants, we have also to handle fiber, reinforced plastics, polymers, and so on. So, of course, uh, the material let's the materials are not covered, but the principles can be applied. But generally, so what we can find in part four is the reference to the steel code. So for steel silos and reinforced concrete and pre-stressed uh, precast reinforced concrete silos uh, with reference uh, to Eurocode uh, 1992. Uh, so this is more or less uh, the scope of uh, the chapter five uh, for silos. And uh, the first point that we have to discuss if we are talking about silos is how can we model the silo and the content, which is quite complex. So the behavior is complex to describe in numerical models. And uh, I think uh, the aim of the code is to simplify it in a way that we have reliable design tools. So therefore, some basic rules are given in part four, first of all, the, the model should reproduce the strength, damping, geometrical properties, stiffness and mass distribution, and it should also include some, somehow uh, external ancillary elements because we have connecting pipes and so on. Um, so we, we have to check the compatibility and we have also to take into account, for example, additional masses that are placed on the roof and so on. So this is uh, one, let's say, uh, basic aspect. Uh, the next one is that we are aware that uh, usually if uh, the silo is accelerated, uh, the, the silo wall and uh, the, the content, they are moving together, but there's also the possibility that there is a, a gapping between the uh, content and the wall, which is quite difficult, let's say, to simulate. So therefore, we can say that uh, we assume in our design rules that the content moves together with the shell. So this is also one basic um, yeah, assumption. The next assumption is that uh, we need to know uh, the specific weight of uh, the bulk unit weight. And this can either be taken from uh, uh, EM 1991, or we can carry out some material test if, for example, the material is not covered by EM 91. 1991, but for another really important aspect uh, in case of uh, silos is that we have to handle uh, different operating filling levels. So if we have a single silo, I think it is not too difficult because usually the maximum operating filling level is decisive for the design. So that's okay. But it's getting more complicated if we are talking about batteries of silos, which are yeah, often used in practice. And in that case, the eigenfrequencies are coupled and different filling states will lead to different uh, shear forces, different uh, effects within the structure. In all these cases, it is not possible to give one general rule. It's just possible to say, be careful and think about it and incorporate different filling states and different filling conditions within the design. 
The same problem is, uh, uh, let's say, occurs in case of um, uh, silos with uh, several cells, because then we have to take into account the most unfavorable distribution of, uh, the, uh, of, the, of the content within the cells. So also in this case, it is not possible to give general rules, but we have to think about how, what, what can happen with uh, the different, let's say, distributions and filling levels within uh, silos with cells. So the structural analysis that is recommended is the force-based approach. Um, response history analysis may be carried out as an alternative. Um, so the models that are uh, mentioned in the code are for on-ground uh, silos, simple beam models with distributed masses. And for elevated silos, it's strongly recommended uh, to uh, incorporate the substructures because you can have a period shift and uh, this will also influence the acceleration on, on, on the content and uh, the silo. And furthermore, um, it is also possible uh, for squat silos uh, to take into account uh, the a model with shell elements and volume elements, but uh, you will see the uh, this this effect. Let's say that a part of the um, uh, of the seismic action is uh, taken by the friction that the button is also incorporated in the uh, equivalent static uh, load distribution. So it's not necessary to do it, but we mentioned it in the code. The behavior factors are uh, limited. Um, the reason is that uh, we have to handle uh, thin wall structures, which are, um, let's say, likely to buckle. And uh, because of that, we have a maximum uh, value of uh, 1.2 in DC1 for uh, welded uh, and bolted uh, steel silos, and 1.5 for concrete and uh, pre-stressed, precast reinforced concrete silos. For the substructure, it's allowed to apply higher ductility classes. However, then we have to take into account the effects on the silo, which is uh, resting on the substructure. Um, there's nothing to say because uh, we can uh, we can check the uh, the behavior factors in part one two. Another really important aspect, which was not incorporated so far, is the vertical component. I will show it later on. So we have to take into account the vertical component as a minimum of 1.5 and uh, the horizontal uh, and the Q factor, which was applied in, in horizontal direction. So the vertical component is, uh, is quite important from my experience. So the next step is um, we need now to, yeah, to provide rules uh, for the calculation, at first for the reaction forces and moments, and for the pressure distribution. So this is subdivided. So there is a reason for that, because in practice, you always need at first, at the very beginning of the project, you need the reaction forces and moments for the foundation. So therefore, we are providing really simple rules on the safe side to have an estimation in an early stage of the project. So what we are doing here is just multiplying the acceleration, the spectral acceleration of uh, the first eigenmode with the total mass, and the lever arm is assumed to be um, the half of uh, uh, the uh, total uh, silo height. Furthermore, uh, a factor lambda can be considered um, for using uh, the um, uh, forces and moments, because usually not uh, the, the total uh, weight of uh, the silo uh, is uh, activated. But this depends, let's say, uh, on the user. So if at an early stage in the project, uh, we will jump on the safe side, then we can use, let's say, a higher lambda factor. So this is uh, more or less the first step. After the calculation of the reaction forces, we need the pressure distribution. So because we have to distinguish, we have to design the foundation, the anchorage, and so on, but we have also to carry out the shell design and the design for the hopper according to Eurocode 3. And for Eurocode 3, we need stresses. And for stresses, we need pressure distributions. We have to distinguish between uh, pressure distributions due to horizontal seismic actions which are shown here. 
Rules are given for circular silos and rectangular silos. So we see that in uh, for a rectangular silo, we have more or less a constant pressure at different heights. And for a circular silo, we have, a, a, let's say, a function which is, uh, let's say, acting as a pressure on one side, and it's more acting like a tension on the other side. But keep in mind, we have to superpose it with uh, the hydrostatic pressure, and then the, uh, the, the content is always, usually always in contact uh, with uh, the uh, silo wall. So how can we describe uh, this uh, pressure function? So we can uh, describe it by a reference pressure function, uh, which is uh, given here. And the reference pressure function is defined uh, by uh, 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 an aeration profile, which is here shown in green, alpha z. And uh, this is, uh, let's say, the function of the acceleration profile along the height of the silo. So then we, we need the bulk unit weight and some geometrical parameters that describe the effect of uh, the friction at the, the bottom uh, of the silo. So we can reduce it and then uh, uh, we can increase it if we have a a certain height above uh, the bottom of uh, uh, such a, a silo that we would like to design. Furthermore, we need also the same functions for the conical hopper, but it's quite similar. We only have to take into account the angle of inclination of uh, the hopper wall. So for rectangular silos in horizontal direction, we need just to consider we are on the leeward side, on the windward side, and then we can apply easily the same pressure that we calculated before and on the walls parallel to the horizontal component of the seismic action, it is not necessary uh, to apply uh, any, uh, let's say, load because uh, the, the full seismic action is activating the content uh, in the direction of uh, the seismic action. However, this is not everything we have to consider also to consider the vertical component, which uh, I will present uh, in a couple of slides. So coming back to the acceleration profile, it is quite clear that on one hand, we have a hydrostatic pressure and the hydrostatic pressure is shown here on the left and we have the seismic pressure. So now we can assume uh, a constant acceleration profile profile at a high of uh, two thirds, we can assume a linear acceleration profile, or we can also make use of uh, the shape of the first eigen mode, or we can also consider higher eigen modes, and we can apply multimodal uh, acceleration profile. Once we have defined the acceleration profile, we can calculate the pressure distribution by using the ordinates of these acceleration profiles at each, let's say, high, and then we will get the pressure function. The pressure function is shown here, and this shows the difference between the different approaches. So you see on the top, there is a filling pressure in both cases. That's the hydrostatic pressure, and the hydrostatic pressure can be calculated the code one. This has to be superposed with the pressure that comes from the seismic action. So here you can also see in green that a part of the base shear is taken by the friction. So this is considered within the function, within the geometrical description. And then we have to superpose it. And you see that uh, the result resulting total torque is an unsymmetric pressure. And the reason, therefore, is that we have always to check if there is a, let's say, tension force acting on the side of the wall. In that case, we have to set the value to zero. But if we have to add the filling pressure plus the pressure coming from the hydrodynamic effects of the earthquake, then we have to add both components. And this is a result. 
So then uh, the second uh, option, which is shown here, is a linear profile. And uh, the linear profile shows, uh, let's say, the filling pressure, and then the variable uh, acceleration pressure. So it looks similar, but you can easily see that there is a difference. And then you will get the total pressure. So if you compare uh, the so if you compare the results for uh, some uh, side trees, my recommendation is uh, to take the linear distribution. But uh, it is not the case that the difference in the design is uh, critical. So the the constant pressure can also be applied. But of course, there are some differences because it is uh, it is a different assumption. Uh, but both uh, assumptions are, um, yeah, pretty okay for for the design of the uh, silo. As mentioned before, it is uh, quite important uh, to consider the pressure also in uh, vertical direction, and uh, the pressure in vertical direction uh, is activated by the vertical component of uh, the earthquake. So this was not considered in the former code, um, but uh, I think it is quite important to consider this component because we have a huge mass uh, uh, resting, for example, on a hopper, and then we are accelerating the mass uh, in vertical direction, and this can cause higher frictional pressures, higher horizontal pressures, and higher vertical pressures of the filling loads. And we have also some uh, hydrodynamic um, uh, effects that uh, should be covered. So what was easily done here is to take the pressures that are already there from the calculation according to Eurocode 1 and to increase these pressures by a scaling factor, which is simply calculated uh, by the ratio of the vertical uh, pressure uh, uh, by the vertical acceleration to the uh, to the gravity acceleration for the first eigen period. So, if we are not considering soil structure interaction effects, we can easily take uh, the maximum uh, uh, the maximum acceleration from the spectrum. If we would like to take into account soil structure interaction effects, we can probably modify it a bit. But it is quite important to consider the vertical component. So, why is it important? Just one example, if we have a silo construction with a hopper and we have a filling load on top, then this will uh, produce um, compression forces uh, in, uh, in, the, in the compression ring um, in the direction of uh, this ring, which is usually, um, yeah, uh, which is usually added uh, to the silo construction. And uh, this has to be verified uh, for buckling. That's one aspect. The second aspect is that usually we have only single support there, and uh, the buckling occurs mainly in the region above the support. So in that case, we have to consider these effects, and uh, this will influence the design a lot. And these are the critical points. And therefore, um, I really would like to highlight this point which is now implemented uh, in the code. So which kind of verifications uh, should be very uh, carried out? So we have to verify the global stability. Um, so we saw it in Turkey. Uh, elevated silos, they are really sensitive, really, really sensitive uh, in terms of overturning, in terms of buckling, everything. So we have to be very careful uh, with uh, global stability. Uh, the same with foundations, so it comes also in line with the especially elevated silos. So several uh, several failures and total collapse were obtained in Turkey. Furthermore, um, and we need to verify uh, the silo shell and hopper. This is not a problem anymore because we have excellent buckling uh, stress and buckling verification rules in the corresponding codes. And we are completely compatible now. So it's not necessary to regulate it here. We define overstrength, we define the Q factors, we define the, the safety factors. So everything is given. We just have to jump to the steel code, and that's it. So then we have to uh, uh, verify the substructures. That's what I already mentioned. And uh, in case 
So base isolation, okay, we don't uh, have to worry about the structure, but we have to worry about the connections of the structure to the pipelines, for example, or to the pipes that are connecting to the structure. So that is quite important, and this aspect uh, needs to be mirrored. Um, furthermore, um, we have to keep in mind uh, that if we apply higher uh, um, behavior factors, we should always take into account uh, sufficient overstrength and uh, a minimum overstrength of uh, 1.25 uh, is uh, defined. And all the rules for pre-install anchors are given in uh, EN 1993 18. And uh, yeah, so the remaining remarks are we have to check relative displacement, displacement compatibility, because this part four mirrors not only the, the silo itself, it also considers the connections, which are always decisive in case of an earthquake. So we really have to take into account these connections, which is usually a problem practice because it's subdivided between engineers, process engineers. So there is some communication needed, but uh, we try to highlight these uh, aspects in the code. Um, so if uh, we would like to define damage limitation and uh, operation limit states. So there are many, let's say, different ways to do it. Uh, so uh, the easiest way, let's say, for us to say is that damage limitation is satisfied if everything remains in the elastic range. This is one rule. And for the operation limit state, we should verify that uh, the function of the silo and its, let's say, pipe system that are connected and the equipment is completely functioning after an earthquake. And if we, after some checks, and if we would like to continue with the production without any checks, then we have also to uh, define further rules and acceptance criteria for the operational limit state, which is always, let's say, uh, which has also uh, derived in each specific case. So this was more or less uh, the part on the silo construction. And now I'm, uh, I would like to present the Annex A. Uh, so Roberto will later on present the tanks and make use of Annex A. Um, but uh, we thought that it makes sense to present Annex A as a separate, let's say, um, tool for the engineer to derive uh, the static loading functions uh, for tanks, uh, because that is quite easy now. And uh, I would really like to highlight the differences between the former version of the code and the recent version of the code. So what is the aim for the definition of uh, these uh, pressure functions? So we have to handle hydrodynamic effects um, in a simplified way within the code. So this is the aim. Um, we would like to avoid uh, the situations that are shown here. So the buckling uh, at the bottom, which is usually activated if the hydrostatic pressure and the hydrodynamic pressure are, let's say, acting with an overturning moment in one direction. Furthermore, we would like to avoid the compression phase failure at the top, which here, if we have, let's say, a reduced hydrostatic pressure at the top and at the same time, a compression circumferential direction. Furthermore, we have to avoid diamond shape buckling, which can occur due to the combination of high shear and normal forces uh, at the bottom. And uh, so the shape of, of the buckling uh, is, is a bit different. So that's what we would like to avoid. And we do it in the following way. As in the former code, uh, we can represent the hydrodynamic effects in a tank in a simplified way. So because we would like to avoid uh, to carry out a full hydrodynamic analysis uh, with an explicit dynamic analysis. So that's not the aim of the code. So the aim of the code is uh, to distinguish between the convective pressure distribution, which comes with 
say, uh, from uh, some waves at the top. Then the intrinsic rigid pressure component. So in this case, the content or the liquid and uh, the tank are moving together. And we have to handle the impulsive flexible pressure component. In this case, the tank and the content are moving uh, together and there is some flexibility in the tank. So this is usually the case for steel tank. And this impulsive flexible component is quite important. So we can see the different pressure distributions and we can see also uh, in the top view on the right, the distribution in circumferential direction. The same can happen due to vertical seismic excitation. In that case, we have impulsive rigid, impulsive flexible, and convective pressure component, of course. So we can easily see the difference between impulsive rigid is that uh, the impulsive rigid, in that case, the tank structure is moving up and down without any deformation. But for the impulsive flexible, we have, let's say, a kind of breathing of the tank. So we can see the deformation and the pressure distribution is quite different. And the top view shows this breathing and the pressure distribution at a certain height. So how can we incorporate it? And here I would like to highlight, let's say, the difference between the first and second generation. In the first generation, it was already the case that all the effects were considered and they were considered in a correct way, but in a more complex way, because uh, a time history should be carried out if you would really like to calculate the stresses within the shell. Therefore, it was necessary for the convective pressure distribution to calculate the vessel function, to calculate, uh, uh, to carry out a calculation with the time history analysis. And the same occurs if we would like to calculate the rigid pressure distribution. This is completely fine. This is completely correct. We cannot do it, but it's not so easy for the practitioner. It is even more complex if we have a check on the impulsive flexible pressure component. Also, in this case, we have to carry out time history analysis, but in an iterative way, because usually the added mass concept has to be applied. And this is only, uh, let's say, this can only be solved by uh, iterative solution with some powerful tools. And you have usually to couple finite element program with some medical tools. So the basic idea was in the second generation to provide a force-based approach based on the theory that was already given in the former code, but to provide the engineer uh, a simple, uh, let's say, possibility uh, to calculate the pressure distribution. Therefore, uh, the tank, in this case, the cylindrical tank, was described by dimensionless coordinates, zeta and gamma. So gamma is the ratio, that's the slenderness, it's the ratio of the filling height to the tank radius, and zeta is the dimensionless height in vertical direction. And then the basic idea was to describe the pressure functions by one function for all the different types of uh, pressures. So you see here in red, I called it normalized pressure functions. These pressure functions are given in table A1 to A4. First, first function that we need. Gamma E is the participation factor. Participation factor is given in table A6 and A7. Then the other remaining variables are known and only the spectral acceleration for the first fundamental period has to be calculated. Roberto will show you how to calculate the first eigenmode. This is also a simplification. We are not taking into account higher eigenmodes. And then the same principle as for the silo construction is applied. At first, we are providing for the practitioner the formulas for calculating the reaction forces and moments, base shear and overturning moments. 
can be easily calculated. First step. Second step, if you enter the tables in Annex A, you can see that there are some tables. And these tables are describing for each pressure type the distribution of the pressure along the height of the tank with respect to the slenderness and the vertical coordinate setup. And this can be multiplied with the spectral acceleration, some of the geometrical properties, and then we can apply these pressure functions to a finite element model and uh, can go on with the buckling verification um, as uh, I already mentioned. So in the end, we will come up with uh, such a finite element model, for example, we are applying the pressure distributions uh, in a, with a, as a static equivalent load, and we can easily see the pressure distribution which is shown here on the right, and the corresponding stress distributions uh, for each of the uh, different uh, pressure functions. And this is the basis for the usage of uh, the steel code. Um, this is part, uh, so it's, it's zero code three, part one six, buckling for shells. And then we can make use of all the concepts that are uh, available there. So. This is nothing new. And this is now a closed concept. And this is the recommendation. However, Roberto will uh, introduce it. We are also allowing alternatives to this force based approach. So it is also allowed to apply more uh, uh, calculation verifications. But it is more time consuming to apply them, and we think that it's uh, on the safe side. Just a, a final uh, remark. Um, as I already mentioned for silos, we were writing the documents also for uh, for the for the tanks. And uh, the theory behind is described more detail in, in the document. And um, so it was not possible now to go into the details, but um, I hope that it was, uh, it was uh, possible to follow, let's say, the basic concept and the idea behind the code. And uh, so I would like to, to thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, I'm ready for questions and uh, discussion. Thank you, Professor Butenberg, very interesting. Uh, in presentation uh, full of uh, details and uh, the questions uh, that I received so far uh, is the demonstration of these images. So the first uh, question is uh, coming from Daniel uh, Chucker, taking at University of Kaiser Lauter, that uh, is uh, asking why is the key factor for silos QS equal 1.2? You ask the finest the energy dissipation as a, uh, uh, it the failure, uh, the two failure mechanisms in silos is stability failure and plastification. So if the foot flange is uh, thin enough, uh, you would have energy dissipation through plastification without stability failure. But if the stability failure of the shell is governing, it means that there is only a linear elastic behavior of the structure, and Q would be equal to one. So basically, the, 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 the critics is uh, to the use of QS 1.2 in case of stability seems to be too much. Um, so I, I think uh, this can be discussed, of course. Um, so um, we, we have to consider that uh, we have to look on the on the full concept. So on one hand, we have the uh, say factors uh, that has to be defined. And on the other hand, we have the behavior factor. So I think every, every structure exhibits some, let's say, possibility for energy dissipation. And uh, so it does not mean that the tank is completely collapsed if we have if we have a um, if we have a stability failure. So one point two is a highly reduced value, 
And we think that it's a compromise because we have also to think about uh, the economic issue. We did also some uh, comparisons with the US codes. And uh, if we are going always completely on the safe side, it's also problematic. So we think that uh, it, is, um, it is meaningful not to reduce it to 1.0. So because there is also conservatism uh, uh, in the world, uh, for example, if we check the stability there, sometimes we are far on the safe side with uh, these, uh, let's say, empirical buckling factors. And if you look on the on the complete package, it is reasonable not to go, let's say, lower than one point two from from our point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, second question. So we have a lot of questions. So I will. Uh... Read the time that we have. So I hope yeah, I will try to answer. <laughs> sure. Yeah, thank you. So the second one is from Lutsun Gok from Walker Kenny AG. Are there any changes regarding the limitation of areas with low seismicity uh, from your uh, ACA to part one? Or is the is this criterion still applicable for vessels? Uh, so basically, is is asking if um, uh, there are some uh, so limitation of areas with low seismicity applying to uh, the vessels, or is completely intact. Um, so this is not uh, this is not the topic of part four, um, but I can answer this. So it is uh, defined in part one one, and there is some uh, flexibility for uh, uh, national regulations. And uh, in part one one, uh, everything is defined regarding low, uh, very low, and uh, moderate and high seismicity. Um, so one, uh, if if we uh, we are in, in low or moderate seismicity, or if we are in very low seismicity. So we should always, always check the wind, so the, the comparison with the wind loads. So this is, this is necessary. For example, if a vessel inside the production unit is not designed for wind load, then also a relatively low earthquake load is decisive for the design. So I think to, uh, to say that there is a certain value that can be used for no verification and verification. We should be very careful. So I would always like to, to do the comparison. Thank you. Uh, I totally agree with you. So the uh, next uh, question is, could, uh, could the overstand factor of 1.25 in the design of anchors be seen as an equivalent of designing the anchors for seismic action taken from the elastic spectrum? Uh, <clears throat> so this is, um, <clears throat> this is only the, the minimum value. So usually we make reference uh, to part one one because uh, the further regulations are given there. So, but we are not allowing to go under this well, so to go lower than this value as a minimum. And this was, let's say, um, we the orientation was uh, part one two in our case because if you check, let's say the, uh, the the damage to, for example, to elevated silos and also to uh, to on ground uh, tanks, you easily see that uh, if there is an uplift, so if there is a damage to the anchorage, then we have an increase of the stresses. So we would like to, to be on the safe side, uh, but the design is regulated in part one, two. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes and then we have to stop. So let me select some uh, other questions. And uh, so I ask uh, maybe uh, Christoph to answer offline if, uh, if possible. Of course, so, yes. Oh, oh, yeah. What values of the response spectrum are to be used for the cases with the vibration period of the convective component greater than four seconds? Is from Carlos Arboleda. Uh, greater than four seconds? Yeah. 
Um, so for the convect, so we, we have to use a, a different spectra. Um, so that's what I did not uh, present. So we have to use on one end elastic spectra and sometimes design spectra, uh, depending on the approach that we are following. Um, and we have also to define different uh, damping values. Uh, so for uh, for the um, for the uh, for the application of uh, higher, let's say, uh, periods, there is this minimum value that we can apply. So we are not uh, we are not going to take this displacement uh, based spectrum. Okay, let me read a couple of uh, questions and we have to stop. So in the definition of uh, uh, significant damage limit states, uh, uh, what is the meaning of a structural integrity with the controlled leakage? Because in the ASME standard, yeah. integrity means pressure integrity, no leak. Uh, is it, it is a question of pressurized or, uh, or pressurized system. So, uh, no, it, it is it is a general rule. So, for example, if we expect to have uh, a certain amount of damage, uh, it can happen that we have a spilling over uh, of uh, the liquid inside the tank, and in that case, um, there should be some, let's say, reservoirs made of reinforced concrete. Uh, to protect the surrounding and to take this, let's say, uh, spilling over of, uh, of the liquid. So some, let's say, the rears in the second line uh, should be installed to cover a controlled leakage. So if there is nothing, that's not, that's not the basic idea of uh, part four. But we cannot prescribe that they should be completely tight. So that, that's, for us, it was too much. So the combination seems reasonable. OK, this question was from Pierre Labin, uh, P21. Uh, so uh, we, we finished the time. So just, uh, just a question by me. So the background documents will be um, so are, um, are available at the moment, and they can be used. I think so. There are submitted. There are. I'm not sure that they are publicly available. No. Okay. But they should be. So we will publish it. Okay. So, I see you, Roberto, is saying yes. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So forgive me to stop here, and uh, now I leave the, the word to my co-chair, Marco Marinkovic, for the introduction for the next speakers.